This time of year, you'll see nativity scenes popping up all over the place, from private homes to churchyards and other public displays. For a brief moment, the world almost remembers that God actually entered human history as one of us. And today we're going to slow down and ask ourselves, why would God do that? This is that special time of the year when a lot of people who might not really care about Christianity January through November suddenly show at least passing interest in the birth of Christ. The TV networks and streaming services are starting to show Christmas programming, and if you can wade your way through some of those terrible Hallmark movies, you're still going to find some content relating to the incarnation of Christ. That unbelievable moment when God the Son entered our earthly existence as one of us, a full-fledged human being. And so today, I'm going to follow suit a little bit, and we're going to turn our attention to the subject of the Incarnation, and ask ourselves why it's such an important concept. Because obviously, it's one of the biggest turning points in the history of this world. And I know there are skeptics who love to say that Jesus wasn't real, that He's a figment of our imagination, a convenient fiction invented by the power brokers of this world in order to keep the masses enslaved. It's a very cynical, tinfoil hat perspective, to say the least, and it's one I think we can tie at least a little bit to the writings of Karl Marx, who brought the idea of class struggle to the Western table. He said, you've got oppressors and you've got the oppressed. And so obviously, from his perspective, the Christian church is the oppressor and the rest of humanity becomes the oppressed. It was a worldview that, when I was younger, I thought was basically doomed by the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. For more than 70 years, the former Soviet Union had tried to implement Marxism in the real world and it led to a massive humanitarian disaster. Something like a hundred million people were slaughtered on the altar of Karl Marx over the course of the 20th century. And in the Soviet Union, there was an awful lot of brutality, including the willful starvation of millions by Stalin. Instead of bringing about peace, harmony, and equality, the Soviet Union just substituted a new ruling class that considered average people to be dispensable if it meant achieving their ideological dreams. And when they so obviously failed, I thought that might be it. I thought maybe we would have learned the lesson that the politics of resentment can only lead to moral disaster. But alas, you're still going to hear it today. I'm actually alarmed that I now hear a lot of younger people still talking about the supposed miracle of communism as if we learn nothing from the past. But now when you think it would be obvious to all of us that Marx was wrong, a disturbing number of people are still on the hunt for oppressors, people they can blame for the pain that comes from living in this broken world. Now, I'm not claiming that we've achieved perfection here in the West, because obviously we haven't. We still have an awful lot of problems. But we also don't have the state telling us what we're allowed to believe, or threatening our lives if we've got the wrong opinion. Although I do think there's a trend in that direction, and it's kind of disturbing. Today, the labels are different. It's not labor versus capital, but it's still the language of the oppressor and the oppressed. And over the years, we've had people take that idea to the church itself. They insist that Jesus was a fictitious character developed to keep the powerful people in charge. You're going to find these kinds of ideas circulating on that amazing font of religious knowledge, the Internet. But there are no serious historians who believe that Jesus didn't exist. The evidence is just far too overwhelming. And the idea that the story of Jesus was invented by powerful people to help oppress the poor and keep them in line? Well, that's completely laughable if you take the time to actually read the source documents. I mean, yes, 
the church did behave reprehensibly in the medieval period. And the modern church isn't exactly blameless either. And so I'm not denying that a lot of nominal Christians have actually caused a lot of pain and heartache, sometimes in the name of God. But the horrible behavior of Christians has always been a departure from the person and teachings of Christ, who went out of his way to help those who were actually being oppressed. In the Bible, we find this remarkable statement in a sermon that Peter preached after the earthly ministry of Jesus had come to an end. Peter speaking to a group of Gentiles at the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion who was converting to Christianity. And, and here's what he says. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So let's think about this carefully. If the story of Jesus was invented to control you, to keep you in your place, to make you compliant, then that would make this book the worst piece of propaganda ever written, because one of the key messages of the first century church was liberty. Jesus went about doing good and setting people free from the oppression of sin. And then Peter tells us this is why God sent his Son. It's the complete opposite of what the cynics might be telling you. I'm also reminded of a passage found in Luke's other book, the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus essentially launches his public ministry by participating in a synagogue service. Here's what it says in Luke 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. So, because we're dealing with the Incarnation today, let me just stop here for a moment and point out something kind of profound. Jesus had a normal childhood. He had a normal, authentic human life. The Incarnation was a central feature to who He was and why He came. But He was human, like us. Let's keep reading. And as was His custom, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to Him. And of course, we, we always hear a lot from Isaiah during the Christmas season because he predicted the appearance of Messiah. It continues. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So, again, if this book was written by evil people trying to enslave us, you'd have to argue that they're not very smart evil people. And I know that I've pointed this out on other shows, but let me say it again because it's just so important. Back in the days of American and Caribbean slavery, there were slave owners who did not want their slaves to read the Bible. Why? Because it would give them the idea that God prizes personal liberty. So eventually, someone produced a heavily redacted Bible with most of the content removed. Today we call it the Slave Bible, and it only included the passages that didn't reveal how God feels about oppressing people. So again, if this book is really propaganda written by powerful church people who intend to subjugate me, let me tell you this, they did a bad job of it. I mean, just ask yourself, why does the Chinese government bulldoze Christian home churches and persecute the followers of Christ? It's not because the story of Jesus is useful for keeping peasants in line. And speaking about my place, it's time for a really quick break, but I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. In the earliest years of the Christian movement, the subject of the incarnation of Christ proved to be a, well, a little tricky for some people. 
On the one hand, you had people with a Greek bent who thought the idea that God would become a physical human utterly ludicrous. And it's the word physical that they had a problem with. From the Greek perspective, the created material universe is flawed, and you can only find true perfection somewhere out there in the non-physical realm. So the idea that a perfect holy God could adopt a physical human presence seemed, well, ridiculous. A good example of this would be an early heretic from the second century named Martian. And that's Martian with a C as opposed to someone from the planet Mars. <laughs> Martian believed that the world had been created by an inferior deity they called the Demiurge. And he said Jesus came to fix the Demiurge's mistakes. It was a Gnostic approach to Christianity, and of course it was roundly condemned by most of the church. And among the ideas that Martian insisted on was the notion that Jesus' body only seemed to be human. It was an illusion, because a perfect God, he said, would never condescend to our level. So from that perspective, he said that Jesus was only divine, and not divine and human. If you want a word for his idea, it's docetism, from a Greek word that means illusion. So to these people, the Martianites, the Incarnation was nothing but an illusion. But then on the other hand, we also had people who pushed the needle in the opposite direction, insisting that Jesus was only human. He may have been special, he may have been called God's Son, but at the end of the day he was just a human being. A good example of that kind of thinking was a guy named Serinthus who was contemporary to the Apostle John. In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence suggesting that John may have actually written his gospel, at least in part, as a response to this guy. Serinthus denied the virgin birth, the Christmas story, and said that Jesus was just a regular guy with two normal parents, and that he was possessed by the Spirit of Messiah at his baptism. And then he lost his special status the moment he was crucified. He may have had a divine mission, Serintha said, but he was really just human. Now, both of these approaches are kind of understandable when you examine the person of Christ from a strictly logical position, the way that a Greek philosopher might do it. Our logic tells us that you can't have two natures at the same time. You can't be God and human. But it's the wrong conclusion because it's not what God says about the subject. The truth of the matter as often happens with the Bible, actually lies in the tension between those two different things. On one end of the heresy spectrum, we have people who say that Jesus was nothing but human. And then on the other end, we have those who insist that He was only divine. But the way the Bible talks about it, Jesus was both, fully God and fully human, at the very same time. In other words, what we see in Jesus is what God would look like if He was a human being. And that's where the Christmas season gives us a lot of cause to really think about human existence. And I suppose we could get bogged down in a lot of theological hair splitting because nobody has completely wrapped his or her mind around how the Incarnation works. I actually had to tell somebody that in a letter the other day. I don't know how it works, but I will say this. When Christians say that Jesus is fully God and fully human, it doesn't mean that he's 50% of each. He's both, 100% at the very same time. And it also doesn't mean that he switches modes, sometimes flipping on the human switch and other times flipping on the God switch. Although, you will see moments when his divinity absolutely flashes through his humanity. These moments where Jesus suddenly reveals his divine power, like the time he told Nathaniel, that he already knew who he was because he had seen him sitting under a tree before they ever met. So why is the birth of Christ such an important development in the story of the Bible? Today a lot of Christians focus on his death and resurrection because we understand we can't be saved without those things. It was at the cross, after all, that Jesus took the penalty for my sins on himself. But you know, it's not just the death and resurrection of Christ that saves us because well, in that case, he could have just manifested himself as a fully grown adult and gone straight to the cross without having to spend about three decades living a very difficult life. But that life, that authentic human life, also matters. It means that God the Son is one of us, and the Bible reveals that he stays that way forever. 
I mean, don't forget, when Jesus rose from the dead and His disciples were trying to wrap their heads around the fact that He'd come back from the grave, He invited them to touch Him, to make sure that He was still a real person and not some kind of apparition. In fact, Jesus also ate something to prove the point, and the piece of fish He ate didn't fall through His ghostly presence and land on the floor because He was real. And then in Acts chapter 1, the disciples were told that this same Jesus would come back someday. In other words, that same physical person. So what that means is that the incarnation of Christ was not temporary. That baby in the manger, well, that's a permanent deal. In fact, you'll notice when you're reading the New Testament that Jesus gets several titles. Rabbi, Son of David, Son of God, and of course, Son of Man. And it's that last one, the Son of Man, that Jesus uses the most. He could have chosen to emphasize His divinity, which is what we would probably do, because how do you not underline something like that when you're dealing with people who are clearly inferior to you? But no, Jesus seemed to underline His human identity, calling Himself the Son of Man. But, but why? Why is it so important that Jesus started in that manger in Bethlehem? Well, biblically speaking, we can find all kinds of reasons. Back in Genesis 3, immediately after the compromise, the fall of the human race, God promised that the seed of the woman was going to come and fix things. Messiah, in other words, would come from the human race. And of course, God essentially makes the same promise to Abraham over in Genesis chapter 12, where he says this, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." Now, that promise doesn't specifically mention Messiah, but as you read through the rest of the narrative, right through to the end of the book, you quickly discover that Christ was the real blessing that came from Abraham. Here's the way that Paul describes it in his letter to the church in Galatia. He says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And then he goes on to explain that you and I can be adopted into the family of Abraham. We consider ourselves to be Abraham's descendants through Christ. So right out of the gate, we know that the birth of Christ in Bethlehem was really, really important if for no other reason than God was keeping His promise. But of course, that's not really the complete answer we're looking for because it makes it look like this is just a matter of heavenly bookkeeping, just a matter of checking off prophetic boxes on God's to-do list. And it still doesn't tell us why. And this is where it proves very important to sit down and read the whole Bible. I know I'm a bit of a broken record. I say that every single week. Read the whole book because there are a lot more answers in here than most people think, and those answers make really good sense. I mean, let's face it, it's the Christmas season, and so a lot of people are cracking open Bibles for one evening to read that famous passage from the Gospel of Luke, the, the one with the nativity scene. But maybe this year, let me challenge you to read your Bible again the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that, and I promise you, by the time you get to next Christmas, you're going to have a radically different perspective on the whole world. And now it's time for another quick break, but don't you touch that dial and don't you click that mouse because I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Today in the spirit of the season, we've been asking why it's so important for God to come as a real flesh and blood, authentic human being. And of course, there's no way we can answer that in a half hour to everybody's satisfaction. All I can really hope to do is start you on the path to discovery so you can begin to discover for yourself why this matters. 
But maybe, let me just cruise through a few more Bible verses so that you've got a good starting point. And if you feel like you might want a little more help getting started studying, maybe go over to BibleStudies.com and take a look at our free Discover Bible course. Just think of it as a Christmas gift from the good people at The Voice of Prophecy. But for right now, let's go over to the book of Hebrews, which underlines one very important reason that Christ became a real human being. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 4. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So again, you'll notice, that's the opposite of oppression. It continues in verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, there's an awful lot of material there, but here are a few little takeaways. First, we know that the wages of sin is death because it compromises our intimate tie to the only source of life in this universe. When you push away your life source, you can just guess what happens next. So in order to save us, Jesus came and died in our place. He conquered the grave. He died on my behalf, and he had to be a human being to do that. Secondly, and this is a big one, he also demonstrated very powerfully that he understands us. The God that Christians pray to, he's been here. He knows exactly how weak and compromised we are. He's been hungry and tired and rejected, subjecting himself to an honest to goodness, real, authentic human experience. And for that reason, you can approach the throne of God boldly. The Bible says you can go to the throne knowing that A, God knows exactly who and what you are, and B, He loves you in spite of that. So the incarnation of Christ underlines the fact that God has entered the arena with us as one of us. In spite of what we've done, God didn't cut our mooring rope and push us away. In fact, He got even closer because God is driven by unselfish love. But then we also have the matter of living the perfect life. When we were originally created, our human existence was supposed to highlight the love of the Creator. We were made in God's image, and in our original state, we were a vivid expression of who God is. But then after the fall, our lives essentially became a lie about the one who made us. Someone could point to our senseless cruelty and our selfishness, and they could defame God by saying, Would you look at that? Is that the work of a loving God? And you know that's what people do. I mean, if there was a court case deciding whether or not God could be trusted, you wouldn't want my life to be Exhibit A. But you would want the life of Christ, because He's the only human being who ever exhibited the character of God perfectly. And what he does, unbelievably, is offer to pull your paperwork out of heaven's filing cabinet and replace it with his own. So now when somebody asks the question, did Sean's life reflect the glory of God? Well, under the terms of the covenant that God has made with us, when they go to pull my file, they're going to find the perfect life of Christ instead. He offers his righteousness as a gift. You and I are now Abraham's offspring. Paul describes it like this, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So, so in other words, because of the incarnation, Jesus can be our substitute. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explains that all of us fell when Adam did. We were born with a tendency to sin, hardwired for selfishness. The decision to turn against God's will had permanent consequences for all of us. But now Christ becomes the last Adam, and He succeeds where the first Adam failed. In fact, He succeeds where all of us fail, 
And now you can be moved from column A, descendants of the fallen Adam, to column B, a part of the family of Christ. I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Let's wrap up today by reading what some Christians call the Magnificat, the prayer that Mary uttered when she found out she was carrying the Christ child. Here's what she said in Luke chapter 1. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked on the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For He who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever." So again, if the story of Christ's birth, the idea of God in human flesh, was invented by a church to subjugate us, they picked the wrong book. Because the incarnation of Christ was an act of God designed to set you free. And I've got to tell you, that baby in Bethlehem, the idea that God cared enough to actually join us as one of us, that's the most liberating idea in the world. Because if God cared for us that much, if He was willing to pay that much to save you, well, you know He values you. I know that some of you grew up thinking God's trying to get rid of you. So sometimes I like to say, I don't think God's an unwise investor. What are the chances after going to those lengths to save you that He's going to try and find a reason to reject you? If you struggle with the idea that God actually loves you, ask yourself this. Given the amount of pain that you've suffered, would you choose living in this place knowing what you know? Probably not. And yet, that's what God did. He chose this place, knowing full well what kind of life He could expect. The prophet Isaiah predicted that Jesus would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, who would be despised and rejected, and He came here anyway. That little baby in Bethlehem is God's guarantee that He cares. What Christians celebrate this time of year is not just a birthday. They're celebrating that God became one of us so that you could know that He can save you. And you can know that He understands you. Jesus lived a perfect life because He knows you can't and He's eager to see you fully restored. He knows that you are weak and frail, a spiritual infant. So He joined us. This was God stepping into our story to clean it up. Thanks for watching. Merry Christmas. I'm Sean Boonstra, and this has been Authentic. Hey, would you help us out? Click that like button, subscribe, and then drop a comment. That by far is the easiest way to help more people watch Authentic. It takes just a few seconds, it's free, and it helps Authentic reach people who are interested. So go ahead, like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks.